wearing our masks as much as possible whenever we are outside our homes, uh, practicing hand hygiene all the time, as frequently as possible. Uh, there's none of it is too much. There's no amount of hand washing, there's too much. None, um, no amount of sanitizer, there's too much. And, and thirdly, uh, distancing, you know, maintaining that distance from each other in order to keep ourselves uh, uh, safe. So these are the three principles on which we will build up on um, everything else. And we hope that together, we can implement these changes in our day-to-day -day lives as we try to progress towards the new normal. So I'll pause here and take any questions that you might have across uh, from any aspect of the response uh, for the next 30 odd minutes. We've now done this in 25 labs across the country, an incredible achievement. Uh, you know, we're solving for three things simultane simultaneously. Uh, firstly, working very hard to get the labs closer to people across the states, across the country. Secondly, working to scale the number of tests we're able to do. And thirdly, making sure that whatever solution we come up with now will be with us into the future. So I know there's been some frustrations for those more interested in why we're not doing as many as in South Africa. South Africa had a very well-established molecular laboratory capacity. I spent three years of my professional life working there. We're paying for the lack of investments in the last 60 years in critical parts of our health sector. We've been one of the biggest advocates for more investments in the health sector. So I hope this is a lesson for all of us, not just at the SCGC, at the state levels, the federal government levels, the private sector, uh, to now start building our laboratory diagnostic capacity and that's what we have started doing, but unfortunately it's not something that can be achieved overnight. That's why we are where we are. But despite all of this, we are increasing our testing numbers every single day. Uh, we're now, we've now tested well over 30,000 people. Uh, a lot of the plans that we have made over the last two to three weeks, uh, those reagents are now, the supply chain is slowly increasing and improving. Those reagents are coming in and we will be able to um, deliver more testing to Nigeria. But remember, it's not just the labs. It's the collection of uh, specimens from people. There's a logistics that needs to be organized. It's the getting swabs to the collectors, getting the samples back to the labs, and getting the results to the states, and the states then distribute the results. So it's a whole food chain of activities that need to happen to improve the uh, efficiency of testing. So the quest second question, what challenge has Nigeria faced in, in procuring uh, medical components? Um, okay, I, I think this is really, I'll take the lab side of things uh, because I, I'll leave the uh, other medical commodities uh, that we're not directly responsible for at NCGC. So the procurement of ventilators, oxygen concentrators and things like that are a responsibility of the parent ministry and they're working very hard uh, to make improve the process around that. You know, the biggest challenge around procuring laboratory equipment and reagents right now is the supply chain bottlenecks. You know, everybody in the world is looking for the same things. Unfortunately, we don't produce any of them in Nigeria. So we, we are reliant on a global supply chain across the world that we are struggling with everyone else to have access to. So maybe we wouldn't be the first on. We're pushing very hard uh, to get in what we need. Sometimes we succeed, but the supply chain is slow. It's slow across the world. The same challenges we're facing in Nigeria, every other country is facing the same challenge. It's more acute here because we're serving a population of 200 million people. Uh, to serve this type of population uh, in an acute emergency is, a, is, is very difficult. You know, we have to bring this in and distribute it equitably, as equitably as possible across the states in Nigeria. So I think the biggest challenge that we face is the supply chain. The second one is getting them out to where they're needed on time across the country and making sure uh, that every state has uh, at least one functional testing center. That's really our goal over the next few weeks, to make sure that at least every state is able to test samples collected in that state without uh, traveling. The third question here is, um, are the available testing kits and components sufficient for Nigeria? Um, right now, we, we have much more capacity than we are, we are testing. So 
our labs are, are by no means exhausted. So the, the biggest bottleneck right now is not the ability in the lab. Uh, we have reagents, we have uh, commodities in the labs. The challenge is really bringing, getting the tests, the samples collected from patients and getting them into the lab. Right now, we have more capacity that we're able to fill completely in the labs in terms of testing. So uh, test kits are not a problem right now. We're working very hard to make sure that the supply chain is, is sustained. So that's the first, uh, those are the first three questions. Um, the next two is, uh, what is the reason behind the increase in cases post lockdown? Um, I, I think we're very clear um, uh, two weeks ago when we announced that um, will likely ease the restriction, and that easing of restrictions is going to likely lead to an increase in cases. You see, this is a virus that is transmitted from one person to another. The, the closer people are with each other, the more you come in contact with each other, the, more, the easier transmission is. So we were, it's a no-brainer that once you ease the lockdown and allow people come out a little bit more, go back to work, uh, start up certain businesses again, that there will be an increased likelihood of transmission. Uh, but, you know, we're not comparing uh, transmission versus nothing. We're comparing COVID versus everything else. Um, you know, how do you make a, a decision between easing the lockdown, therefore accepting that there will be some more cases of COVID versus uh, the challenges people had in accessing uh, cancer care, uh, the HIV treatment, uh, e routine immunization, and these are just issues in the health sector. Uh, access to accident and emergency care, access to casualty, access to health care. That is not even to start considering how people earn a living uh, in order to then afford health care, afford education, afford just food to eat. So this isn't just a question of um, lockdown and COVID versus zero. It's a quest it was a decision between do I ease the lockdown and accept that there will be a small or a big increase in cases of COVID versus do I accept that people will die from everything else? So we have to find the balance. And that's why we, uh, Mr. President, accepted for a gradual calibrated uh, removal of the restrictions, increasing advice to people on personal responsibility around a series of non-pharmaceutical interventions while at the, same time, at the same time accepting that people have to go back to work slowly uh, to start earning a living in order to stay alive uh, to prevent transmission from COVID. So really that was a very difficult uh, decision. So the increase in cases uh, wasn't really a surprise. Uh, we will keep adapting the NPIs and hope that um, over time we won't see a, a, a radical uh, an increase like we've seen over the last uh, few weeks. So the next question is why are you forcing uh, Kogi and Cross River states to accept or announce cases? You know, our role at the Nigeria Center for Disease Control is to support the states. Our function is to support the states with the expertise, uh, sometimes infrastructure, sometimes equipment, in all aspects of a public health response in order for them then to carry out their responsibility of protecting the lives of Nigeria. We've been doing this um, since the beginning of the outbreak and even previously for every state in the country. Uh, Kogi and Cross River is the same as every other state. We've been working with them. Uh, Kogi specifically, we worked very hard with them to pre, uh, respond to a Lassa fever, a few cases of Lassa. We've worked with them on a, a yellow fever outbreak last year. We supported Kogi State in establishing an emergency operations center. We work with the state epidemiologists very closely. So, you know, we're not forcing anybody to do anything. We have no powers of enforcement. Our role is to support the states. We support every state in Nigeria. If you don't want the support we are able to provide, we can't force it down your neck. So, but uh, if tomorrow the doors are open for us in any of those states, we will re-engage with any of those states. We had someone working with Cross River for many weeks, 
and we will continue trying to support the state. Right now, we have a plan for every state in the country. We've asked every state to submit an instant action plan that where many aspects of the public health response will be funded uh, through mechanisms uh, initiated by the federal government of Nigeria. So our work is to provide technical assistance to the states. We're a technical organization uh, providing support in specific public health aspects. We will continue to offer that support to every state in Nigeria. We're not in a, a place to force any state to do anything at all. We we'll provide our support uh, and hope that most of it is accepted. And 35 out of the 36 plus one states in Nigeria uh, not only are happy with our support, actually request more of it uh, every day. Uh, so let's look at the next uh, set of questions. Um, what is the criteria for someone to volunteer at NCDC? Um, you know, NCDC is a, is a government parastatal, um, like many other parastatals. Um, we have a full cadre of staff working here. Our work is very specific. So uh, if you're going to work in the lab at NCDC, you, uh, firstly, you come in during recruitment processes. And many people come in ill-equipped uh, to do most of the work that we do, so we spend a lot of time uh, and effort training our staff in, in order to, for them to work safely. Then we spend a lot of time building capacity for you to do your work well uh, through the very complex uh, testing processes that happen. The same thing happens on the surveillance side, uh, the knowledge management and prevention side, the emergency operations uh, side of things. Uh, working at NCC is not always easy. People look at it and, and see a lot of the glamorous part, but a lot of it is fairly challenging. So uh, in order to volunteer at NCC, firstly, we have a responsibility to define very carefully what the volunteer opportunities are. And once we have defined that, then we select people very carefully on if you have the skills to volunteer. So um, this is not a simple task. So when we advertised for a few people to volunteer when we were scaling up our call center, for instance. We then looked for people that fit into the criteria that we needed for people that can firstly understand the work that we do in order to then answer the calls. Uh, secondly, had the language expertise uh, to speak fluently and confidently to answer these calls and in order to then uh, provide the support that people were expecting. So for every specific uh, area of work at NCDC where we need volunteers, we would look for people with that specific expertise, offer them the added training in order to carry out that role, because whether you're a volunteer or a staff really doesn't matter. We expect the same high levels of standards uh, uh, that we expect of ourselves. So we push ourselves uh, very hard to deliver to Nigerians so that when Nigerians call up a call center or walk to our gate, everybody works with the same level of professionalism that is expected of our staff. So really, this is how we uh, uh, recruit. We uh, staff both staff and volunteers, and we hope that everyone that leaves NCDC after an opportunity to volunteer, whether you're coming in as a volunteer whether you're coming in as a youth copper or an intern, that you leave the organization better equipped to serve yourself, to serve your country, to develop your skills. And we look out for our volunteers, we look out for our interns, we look out for our coppers with the responsibility to develop them further in the skill set, in whatever skill sets they've acquired while uh, working with us in any capacity. So, uh, the next question is, um, I'll quote, is there a specific plan to protect the vulnerable population from COVID-19 in Nigeria? Um, you know, firstly, I'll say we have to define what the vulnerable population is, and that's something um, we're doing increasingly. If you watch some of the um, remarks I've made recently, is that now that we have come to realize that uh, COVID-19 will be with us in the near future. And we have to adapt our response uh, accordingly. You know, in most outbreak responses that we engage with, 
uh, at NCDC. We expect to uh, work very hard to get that outbreak co under control in you know a few days, weeks, and uh, worst case scenario months. Even when we deal with uh, Lassa fever outbreaks that are qu quite intense, we know that uh, at some point we will get most of this under control. Um, with COVID, it's a slightly different uh, virus we're dealing with, a virus that is so transmissible without symptoms. So increasingly, research is coming out on the level of transmissibility uh, of this virus for people that don't have symptoms or people that are pre-symptomatic. So two, three days before you be become symptomatic, you're shedding a lot of virus, and the first few days of your illness, and those with actually a very mild uh, clinical illness. So in cases like that, it becomes very difficult to um, prevent transmission through our normal means. Um, we know that there are a lot of efforts going on around developing a vaccine, but we also know that a best case scenario, we're many months away, uh, and to be honest, there's no guarantee, actually, when we say that we're 12 months away, 18 months away. No other scientist will tell you for sure how long away we are. You know, when HIV came onto the scene, we thought we would have a vaccine in a few years, in five years, in 10 years. And many, many, many years down the line, we still don't have a vaccine. Efforts are still going on. So while we remain optimistic, and I am definitely an optimist about the vaccine, and I'm very much in touch with a few of the groups working on this across the world, um, you know, the pragmatic side of me also says I, I can't overpromise Nigeria that there will definitely be a vaccine in 12 to 18 months. So we have to kind of hedge our bets. Yes, we work towards uh, and contribute the best we can uh, toward the science of developing a vaccine. But we also have to really work hard towards other aspects of the response, improving our diagnostics, improving our therapeutics, uh, using, making the best use of the non-pharmaceutical intervention that we have. So this is kind of the balance of um, uh, evidence at the moment. And going back to the specific questions, every day we're learning more about this virus, about the, the population it infects, and the population that are most likely to have uh, uh, a bad outcome and try very hard to protect them as much as possible. And that will be a lot of the focus of NCDC over the next few weeks, identifying hotspots, both in terms of uh, geographical hotspots, but also in terms of, you know, uh, populations being infected. There's new evidence of a specific clinical syndrome in children. Uh, so, you know, every time we find this out, we work hard to find more information and then uh, define our response a little bit better to focus on these new uh, areas of uh, interest or, or endeavor. So, um, we'll take a few more questions, then we'll call it a day for today. Uh, when is the peak period for COVID-19 uh, spread in Nigeria? To be honest, I wish I knew. And um, the, the answer to this really depends on all of us. Um, we've seen uh, increasing transmission it really focused on high density areas in Nigeria. You know, uh, most of our transmission has happened in cities with a lot of uh, people, right? Uh, the highly densely populated local government, even within Lagos, most of the cases have been in the densely populated uh, local governments in Lagos, in Kano. We're now seeing the same in Borno, in Bauchi, in certain other states. And so <clears throat> um, our response has to be driven by the data on, on what we're seeing. And our assessment right now is that it's impossible to know exactly where the peak is. And remember, even though we, res we report the outbreak as one single outbreak, and you see a nice epic curve for the country, uh, the reality is that there are many outbreaks. The, the transmission in Lagos, uh, Kano, uh, FCT, Borno is different from transmission in Portakot, uh, Iloren, Ibadan, uh, Enugu. Uh, the, the epidemiology of the outbreak is different. So we're, we're not really seeing one outbreak. We're seeing many sub-outbreaks in the context of a global pandemic. Uh, and we have to keep responding to the individual circumstances of, of transmission in that particular area. The drivers of transmission in one part of the country will not be 
the same, exactly the same in everywhere, everywhere else. But what is in our control and what is in your control is how you adapt to transmission. The, your adaptation of our advice in your local circumstance, how much you're using your mask, how much you uh, and the people that you can influence uh, are keeping slightly apart from each other, how often you are washing your hands. So the peak of this outbreak in Nigeria, will uh, a lot of it will de be determined by your actions, the actions of your family, in your community, in your organization. Uh, so really, um, it's not just what we can do from our side, really it's what you can do in the areas of your influence that will ultimately lead and determine what the peak will be uh, in Nigeria. Um, so the, ne the next question is, what is our assessment of compliance level to guidelines uh, for the ease of the lockdown? Uh, today at the uh, press briefing of the Presidential Task Force, I, I referred to a certain story uh, that happened uh, in a, a university in Ghana, uh, many years ago now, uh, the Asashi University um, that was founded by a good friend of mine, Patrick Awa. And he, he referred to um, a story that has never left me. Um, in this university, it's a, it's a liberal arts university in Ghana. He referred to a story where students uh, studying in that university at the master's level um, requested that he uh, stops in, in vigilation during exams in that university. And that the students studying in this university uh, came up to him and said, listen, the value of the education that we're getting in Asashi University means too much to us to be belittled by invigilators that have to go around ensuring whether we were uh, copying from each other or not. That rather than having vigilators, we will hold each other accountable uh, to focusing on our own work and delivering. Because at the stage we are, um, what we are getting out of uh, our time here is not the degree that we are getting. It's not whether we get a first class or a second class. It is the education that we are getting for ourselves as leaders of tomorrow. And if there's really value to that education, we don't need invigilators to go around to check whether we are complying with our own restrictions in producing and showing evidence of our having acquired the knowledge for which we have spent so much time at this university. And I think that is such a, an apt story for what we're really asking Nigerians to do. Um, we're not asking you to wear masks so that compliance with wearing masks is something that we will ask our security agents to enforce or other uh, parts of our society uh, to enforce. We're not asking you to wash your hands uh, and then have someone there to see whether how well you've washed your hands and whether you've done it properly. We're asking you, asking all of us, to take responsibility for doing this, not for anyone else, not for NCDC, definitely not for the federal government, but for your own safety. And so we hope that uh, compliance is not something that will be enforced by an invigilator or a policeman or uh, an authority figure. We really look forward to all of us doing this, not because we're being asked to by some external body, but because we're doing this for ourselves, to stay alive, to protect our families, to protect the people that we love. Uh, really, uh, this is what it's all about. This is our new norm. So it's not about doing this and enforcing compliance. It's doing this for ourselves, because it's the only tool we have right now. It's the only tool that we have to keep ourselves healthy and alive. And, and really, that's my message to all Nigerians. While we work very hard here to, to do the very best that we can to improve testing, to improve knowledge, uh, the key thing really is 
how much are we doing collectively as a society? It's the only way we can get out of this, and I really call on all Nigerians. If there's one message I'd like people to take away from this, to take home to your churches, to take home to your communities, your families, go home tonight and say, listen, guys, how can we organize ourselves to keep ourselves uh, safe, to keep ourselves free from infection? And let's stop asking what NCDC is doing. Let's ask the question, what am I doing? What am I doing? What are we doing collectively to keep ourselves uh, free from this virus? So I'll, I'll take the last set of questions. Um, these last uh, uh, four questions, um, and then we will uh, wrap it up in 10 to 12 minutes. Um, the first one says, can you provide more information on, on the Madagascar cure? and why government is patronizing in Madagascar. So I think the first thing to say, um, the federal government of Nigeria has not ordered, is not ordering, has not requested, and is not looking to request for any quote-unquote cure from Madagascar. Uh, this has been offered to every other African country. We gathered that some will be sent to us. Anything, whether it is sent to us, it is offered, we get, will go through exactly the same processes as anything else. Whether it's a local remedy, a global remedy, a remedy from Madagascar, before any of the regulatory agencies that regulate uh, the introduction of new drugs into the ph pharmaceutical spectrum in Nigeria, will have to undergo clinical trials. It's the only way I can tell whether this pen, if ingested, is safe or not, is by it going, undergoing clinical trials. There's no other way. There's no shortcut. There have been um, so many instances in the past where we've tried shortcuts and we've paid desperately for it. So I, I think the key thing is um, uh, for everyone to recognize that the process is the same. Um, at least for the regulatory medical practice that uh, defines um, how we work. You know, as doctors, uh, we take many vows as we start our practice. Um, and that guides our work. And the most important vow that every doctor takes on graduation from medical school and before you're registered uh, to practice medicine is the vow to cost no harm. To cost no harm is the very first principle. Even before we think about treatments, diagnostics, vaccines, is to cost no harm, to do no harm. And that guides the work that we do. The only way we can know whether something does harm or good is to uh, subject it to clinical trials. Uh, and so this would be the same for anything, whether it comes from Madagascar, Ghana, Anambra, Borno, the principle is exactly the same. And we're encouraging everyone that has something to approach the relevant government agencies, to approach universities, to seek for the grants uh, from whatever they can, to show some level of efficacy, and then potentially include it into the uh, uh, therapeutic uh, pipeline that we have. Um, the next question, please, what is the status of the Chinese experts in Nigeria? Um, I, I think the relevant leaders in the country uh, have addressed this question over and over again. Um, our work in the Nigeria Center for Disease Control is to support the public health uh, response. We try to do this the very best way we can. It's a, an onerous task on its own as it is. Uh, we work very hard to improve these processes. Our hands are full with our area of primary responsibility. Um, the Secretary of the Federal Government gave a very comprehensive answer to the status of um, uh, the so-called Chinese experts, and I think his explanation suffices uh, for this particular question. Um, the next question is a very important one, both as a leader of NCDC and as a parent, is, is when is it safe for schools to resume? You know, this is a very difficult question, and there's no easy answer. Um, 
um, children are the most vulnerable to most infectious diseases. Uh, one is their own vulnerability. Secondly, is their ability to transmit because a lot of the non-pharmaceutical interventions that we are proposing are very difficult for children to implement. Uh, we are proposing that we all wear masks, uh, that we all stay two meters apart, uh, that we all wash our hands as frequently as possible, and many others. We will all recognize, anyone that has a child, uh, how difficult this is for children uh, to implement, and how difficult it is for adults to ensure that children carry out this uh, non-pharmaceutical intervention. This is why the decision on schools is very difficult. At the same time, we all know how important education is. We all know that um, you know, a single day lost in educating a child is a day lost forever, and that we have to find a way of keeping our, our children educated and keeping the education process going. We all know the disparities in access to alternative modes of education in our society. And as public sector leaders, we have to ensure that uh, we don't increase the inequity uh, in our existing inequity in our society. Uh, because the longer schools are closed, uh, many people that can afford alternative modes of educating their children will access those modes. And those that are already uh, deprived of the ideal standards in education are deprived even more. So you can already see how hard a decision is it, it is. Do I uh, keep kids free from uh, COVID-19 uh, by keeping them at home as long as possible? Or, or do I let them go back potentially they're exposed to this new virus um, and everything that comes with it? So I, I think together with the Ministry of Education, um, these are the questions that we will be trying hard to answer. Uh, fortunately, we are not the only country grappling with this uh, problem. Almost every country is challenged with the, exactly the same decisions, how to restart different parts of uh, life, especially education, uh, how to, how this, what impact this would have on primary, secondary, and university, because the contexts are different and decisions have to be made uh, in each of these. Um, so just like we are working with our leadership, uh, providing advice on how to open uh, mosques, uh, churches, uh, markets, uh, schools, mm. these are very hard decisions that we will have to take collectively. Uh, but there are no easy decisions to be made right now around our response. And uh, mine is to really ask for the patience of everyone, but also the knowledge and contribution of everyone to support uh, the evidence base in, in making some of these very difficult decisions over the next uh, few weeks. So really, we'll start rounding up uh, for today. Uh, really, these have been very, very interesting, sometimes very difficult questions that we've, you've all offered today. And I really appreciate uh, the level of depth and detail that we, the questions have offered. I understand that you might be frustrated that there are no easy answers to any of these questions, but I, I, I think my part, parting thought today is really, we need, all, we need the support of everyone. We can't really deal with this on our own. Every country around the world is grappling with the same hard questions, the same hard answers. Do I open up? When I do open up, many countries are seeing an increase in cases. Do I lock down again? Or do I manage my response somehow and uh, ensure that we get on with it and somehow reduce the um, suffering, reduce deaths associated with this new disease as much as we can? It's a unique challenge for humanity. We are a small part of a global challenge. We continue to work very hard. This is month four of non-stop, in fact, month five, we're in May, of non-stop work since January. 
uh, everyone at NCDC and many public health workers across the country are extremely exhausted. But every morning, people come back in the knowledge that we cannot afford to stop. Because stopping means uh, you know, a rebound of this virus. It will mean several 